Astronomy Resources, a how-to on episode 440 of the Actual Astronomy Podcast. I'm Chris, and joining me is Shane. We are amateur astronomers who love looking up the night sky, and this podcast is for everyone who enjoys going out under the stars. So, Shane, we were chatting a little bit about some uh, topics for the show, and you came up with one on uh, maybe some digital resources, of which I don't use as much of, and had some listener questions and some other stuff rolling around in my head. So we'll talk about resources in general, I think. Yeah. Why not? Um, we've talked about it on some previous episodes, both digital and, uh, analog, but, uh, it's always a good topic because I think that this is, uh, you know, one of those things in astronomy that does change over time and sometimes not much time, you know, there's new apps, there's new books, there's new resources that we all discover. So it's, I think it's a good topic to keep fresh. Mm -hmm. No, exactly. And then as well, like, um, sort of hint towards perhaps, uh, figuring out which objects to observe on a given night. Yeah. Um, so starting there, what, uh, what projects are you, uh, working on? And, uh, in relation to that, like what tools slash resources, uh, do you use? And maybe we'll just begin there on the conversation. Yeah, sure. Um, so as far as projects, it's kind of my usual that I've been talking about for a while. I'm, uh, working on, uh, Blake's double star list that is, uh, associated to the RASC and available on their website. For free, uh, I think. For free. Yeah. 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 And also the, uh, Stephen James Omira hidden treasures is, uh, something near and dear to me. And, you know, in between that, just kind of observing some eye candy stuff as well. But uh, those are my two main projects that I'm interested in these days. So uh, I'm going to just, I'm going to hop in right there and say, sure, sure. what, why bother, why bother working on these things? Well, why not just go out and kind of swing around the night sky and take a look at sort of whatever piques your interest or, you know, whatever strikes your fancy at the time. Why, why focus on these two projects for yourself? Well, yeah, great question. Um, you know, I, I kind of do a bit of a hybrid, but you know, if I don't have a list, um, just me personally, I, I sometimes struggle to take the telescope out. It's like, well, mm -hmm. what am I going to look at? Oh, I don't know. I've looked at the ring before and you know, the common stuff. So if I have a list, it's sort of motivation to get out there and, you know, tick a few boxes on the list, which is always mm -hmm. helpful for me. Um, and, uh, it just helps kind of organize my session so that I'm a little more efficient. Although just about every time I'm out, you know, I'll, I'll look at a number of objects on my lists, uh, but I get to a point where it's like, okay, that's been fun. And now I want to just play around, whether it's mm -hmm. looking at some of the, you know, outstanding objects that I've seen many, many times. Um, and that's fun because even those change, you know, depending on the sky conditions or the instruments being used. So mm -hmm. even though I've seen some of these objects many times, they still can appear different to me, which is always fun. Uh, so sometimes I work that into the night or I think on the last episode, Chris, I mentioned that I got the, uh, TMB super mono 16 millimeter. So mm -hmm. now I can compare it to the Zeiss Abbey 16 millimeter. So it's at that point of the night where maybe I'll do some of this type of stuff, you know, tr try a certain eyepiece or compare a certain eyepiece to another one, um, and, uh, just get some enjoyment out of that. So, you know, it, it, that's why I said I'm a bit of a hybrid, but my reason for a list really is, uh, motivation and organization so that I'm looking at some new stuff and not just sort of sticking to the classics, if that makes sense. Yeah. And I'm going to ask you a very perhaps loaded or contentious question next, Ooh, if you're open to it. I'm open. And people should, this is not like the way we're going to try to do these shows a little bit more is like come up with an idea and then kind of thrush them out a little bit, I think. So yeah. Shane, do you care how quickly you actually get through these lists? Not even in the slightest. <laughs> I love it. This, you this know, is my answer too. Yeah. And I think what, like when we first met, uh, you were... Uh, I think you were chair of the observing com committee for the RASC and mm -hmm. I, uh, you know, we, we got to know each other a little bit and I finally completed my Messier list. Yeah. And so I sent it to you and I think you came back with some questions like, how long have you been working on this? And <laughs> I was like, I don't know, two or three years probably. Yeah. And I was sort of embarrassed because I know a number of people grab these lists and six months later they have it done. 
or, you know, in the case of the Messier list, maybe one night you get almost all of it done if you're, you know, got favorable conditions in March. Yeah. Um, but you and I had a great conversation and you were like, this is great. You know, I'm glad that you took the time to really observe yeah. these objects and, you know, blah, blah, blah. And that's how I feel. Like I, this is a hobby that brings me a lot of joy. And if I start placing thresholds and targets and things like that, it starts wow. to feel like work. <laughs> that's no fun. No, no. So I just, you know, go out and if I can see an object or two on my list, that's awesome. I'm a happy man. Uh, if I see 10 on my list, great. As long as I, you know, was able to really take in the observations, but by no means do I ever feel any urgency or need to get through a list in any sort of, you know, timed fashion. This, this is a good topic, even though it's not our topic. Um, <laughs> but I, I remember I was observing with this person. I can't remember who it was, but it was it was somebody who was somewhat new, but like a fairly good observer. And they had gone out and uh, we were observing. I think they observed like eight or nine or something. They they observed like a like a healthy number of objects. So I'll put it that way. And I went and they they kind of had mentioned this. Mm -hmm. And I think maybe like you um, originally thought that I might think, oh, Pasha, you've only observed like eight or nine objects. And I said, well, that's great. And they said, like, how many, they asked me how many I observed. Mm -hmm. And I said, two. And they kind of looked at me kind of funny. And I said, well, I looked at all kinds of different objects, blah, blah, blah. But my goal every night, like sort of like my ultimate goal is to see one new object and an object which I've previously observed in a new way. And that's mm -hmm. it. Mm -hmm. That's, I like that. If I can do that, it's all gold cherries after that. But well, you know, and, and what I like about that, Chris, is like you said, after that, it's all gold cherries. So you, you sort of create something very achievable. And if you exceed it and per, pretty much any night you're out, I'm sure you do. It just feels great. You know, it's, it's like bonus time. Mm. And like, if I can, like on a really good night, if I'm really organized and I can get a few sketches off. That is just like, whoa, yeah. that is, that is, a, that's a lot of work. Like, as you know, Shane, and I'm talking like, this is four hours of work for me to make like these sort of five observations. Yeah. That's yeah. like pretty much just about five hours of work. If I get like a night where maybe observe some in the evening, get up in the morning or have a nice long run at it, that would be the maximum that I could do. And I'm just like done after that, to be honest. Yeah. Yeah, for sure. Uh, what, uh, what projects are you working on? So I have these, these long-term sort of never ending projects. Mm. Like, um, the, the one, the one that I, I, I should mention that the primary one is wide field objects mm -hmm. of which it's just that it's, there's, you know, if there's a new wide field object that I've come across or see in a magazine, and we'll get into that in a few moments, but um, that goes, and I'm going to observe that next. If, if I need a bigger aperture, I'll see if Mike can get his 12 or, or go to a star party and try to find someone who's going to big telescope and, and try to observe it. And, uh, in particular, uh, H2 objects, um, are something that, uh, I have a particular interest in. I've observed many of those that, that are visible in uh, smaller aperture telescopes in particular, extremely wide field ones. Like we think of Barnard's loop or like the angelfish nebula or, um, objects like, um, which not necessarily H2, but, um, you know, I, I see 1396, which is the, uh, the, the nebula that has the elephant's trunk in there up in uh, Cephas, uh, things like the uh, veil nebula or North American, Pelican, and then there's some uh, sharpless objects around it. Uh, large uh, dark nebula like the uh, prancing horse, and you know, which has the the pipe and bowl feature. Uh, different things like that, and star clouds and such. Um, so dark nebula, wide field H2, and then some of the other sort of more specific things are uh, like globular. So I've recently kind of gotten more into those, especially since chatting with Peter and. I did a couple nights where I pretty much just only observed globular clusters for a couple of nights, thanks to kind of Peter sort of uh, Peter Jedicky, who we talked to a few months ago, kind of spurring me onto that. So that's one of the things I love about doing the podcast is um, I wasn't observing globulars as much. And then I talked to somebody who's really into something. I'm like, man, I, I just got to go out and do a couple nights observing only globular clusters to, mm. to scratch that itch. You know what I mean? 
Yeah, it's funny you say the podcast and, and you know the conversations we've had with some of our guests because I've started a little list on my phone just using like the notes app of oh, cool. you know objects that have, are interest to observe at some point based on these types of conversations because yeah. uh yeah there's like a lot of neat things that we that I learn about too you know when we're talking to these folks or it triggers a memory of like yeah yeah why aren't I looking at that uh you know I you know globular you know whether it's a category or you know a particular object yeah um and uh one of them is and this is like a list that I've done a little bit of work on is the Lucien Kemble list that I, I, in part, sort of at arm's length with Kemble help, helped curate in a strange sort of way. Uh, Lucien Kemble was an observer from uh, the Prairie region, and he had created a quasi sort of incomplete list. And I kind of took his work um, verbatim and did some mild editing based on his observing notes, which uh, you know y- you and I had access to, Shane. So. Um, and and tidied it up using some of his other articles that he'd written for magazines over the years and combined that into into a bit of a list. But it's really best for like a 10 inch or or a larger telescope. Um, although a few of the objects I'm going to try for some of the uh, like the uh, Draco dwarf galaxy and and things of that nature, I'm going to try for when I get my uh, big refractor up and running, but that mm. that's a good list. If somebody has like a 10 inch plus scope again, I, I think it's freely available on the RESC website somewhere. If not, uh, you can just ping me and and I'll eventually get it to you. I think it was in one of the journals, wasn't it? At least it was, it was in the observer's handbook. Oh, uh, a couple of years ago. What's it called? The list North, North of Ford, no, something 50 North. I can't remember. Yeah. F- uh, f- like something f- like 50 to the pole 50 to the pole yeah, yeah that's yeah, what it's yeah. that's what it's called so if you google it around you might even just find the link from RESC if not uh i can i can probably dig it up somewhere i mean it's it's free you know and mm-hmm. you know it's not something i'm doing for any kind of money or uh you know kemble's long since passed away unfortunately so you know it's uh yeah. and just sort of an interesting list based on his observations only. And then I yep. I did a little bit of curating of his observations only. So it's not any of my observations or or really with any of my input, it was that. And then, um, and I shouldn't even say it's, it's my curating. What I did is I kind of took um, an article that he wrote um, in combination with his own personal notes, which, uh, which we had a look at in combination with articles that I was able to cobble together in combination with personal correspondence he had with, um, I think at least three or four other observers and, uh, and notes that they had passed back and forth. So, and, and I really didn't add anything of my own to it. Um, but it was sort of like a tribute for, uh, for Kemble, which I think is, is kind of a cool thing. And on that note, uh, before we sort of hop into the rest of our topic here, um, Judy Sterner, who's uh, quite a good observer, uh, she's doing and has created some good presentation material on Kemble. Anyway, she's going to be doing some some presentations in the early autumn. And then uh, her and I were chatting recently about coming on the show mm-hmm. sort of in the mid to late autumn period of time, which with our new format makes it a little bit more achievable since, you know, I, I think Dave is going to come on. Dave Chapman is going to come on sometime between now and then. And I think we have another person lined up. So, you know, that that's going to be a lot easier to fill our, our yearly roster of maybe 12 to 14 guests over the course of a year, instead of trying to do like uh, 52 or something like we did one year or something. <laughs> right. <laughs> a little bit wild. Yeah, absolutely. So, yeah. Yeah. Cool. All right. So, so let's kind of dig in a little bit more on, uh, so you've got your two projects. You're mm-hmm. doing the, uh, Stephen James O'Meara's hidden treasures, which, a, which is a book, but it contains around like 110 ish objects or 109. And then there's a pile of resources. And then you, you've also, uh, get your double star, um, project uh, mm-hmm. from Blake and, and the RSC. So what tools and resources are you using and how do you use them for working on these lists? Yeah. So uh, I have some mainstays in the repertoire, like Sky Safari is uh, uh, something that I use quite regularly, more so for the double stars than anything else. Um, mm-hmm. Just to confirm like star color, 
or if there is any other interesting things in the field, um, I may use Sky Safari just to confirm what I think I saw. Mm -hmm. So I'm I'm always in there or because I do a lot of the double star observing from my backyard and I have obstructed horizons, um, I'll sometimes use Sky Safari as well just to see the, uh, the timing of some objects as to when I can observe them, like when they'll be high enough to see over top of the condo roofs, you know, or that kind mm -hmm. of stuff. So mm -hmm. it's a, it's a handy tool for that. Um, and really a lot of my digital resources are all about sort of preparing for the observing session or determining whether or not I can even have an observing session. Mm -hmm. Um, so the next one on the list, which we've talked about before is, uh, astrophoric. So mm -hmm. astro and then P H E R I C. Um, it's similar to clear sky clock, which, uh, takes a whole bunch of different weather forecasts, kind of puts them all together for an astronomical person, you know, somebody who wants to observe. So both of these apps are very similar. Like they'll tell you about, uh, you know, cloud cover, um, transparency, seeing conditions, when it really gets dark. Um, what else? Uh, astrophoric will tell you like temperature, wind, humidity. Mm -hmm. uh, there's a bunch of different data points in there, as well as a map representation of the cloud cover that is expected at that time. Mm -hmm. um, so there's a whole bunch of things there that will help me, you know, determine whether or not I should take a telescope out. And for the most part, I'd say like both of these apps are fairly accurate the day of. Um, which is like most weather forecasts. Uh, you know, if you start looking two or three days out, it's, you know, I wouldn't bet my next paycheck on the results there, <laughs> but mm. it gives you some directional, uh, you know, indication of whether or not you, you might be able to observe. So mm -hmm. that one's pretty handy. Um, and then any kind of cloud, uh, imagery like satellite imagery is kind of nice to see, you know, how the evening might be shaping up. Mm-hmm. Uh, and then something that's a little more relevant for you and I, uh, you know, these days again is, uh, firesmoke.ca. So the, uh, the current smoke forecast and where it might be covering and how thick it might be, um, you know, that starts to factor in a little bit. And then, um, you know, on my watch, uh, so I have an Apple watch and it has, um, it has a, a night mode. I, I don't know if everybody's familiar with that. And actually I should have checked. I don't know if it's on all of the Apple watches or not, but it is. Yeah. So night mode is awesome. You turn that on and then when the watch detects low light, it just switches it all to red and turns down the brightness of the face as well. So it becomes a little more conducive to, uh, astronomical purposes. Although it's not a bad idea to just put it into theater mode so that, uh, it's not brightening at all. But, uh, I have a number of little apps on my watch. Like I created an astronomy face so that I have some relevant data just on my wrist, like KP index to understand if the Aurora might be popping off, mm. um, current weather, you know, like the temperature and the humidity, uh, wind conditions, um, kind of anything that might be relevant, you know, while you're observing, uh, I just put on the old watch, like, you know, sunset, sunrise, um, what else is on here? That's, oh, that's super handy. Yeah. And, and even a little compass face or uh, what is these called? complications, uh, yeah. a, a compass complication, uh, in, in the rare event that I'm aligning like, a an equatorial mount and, you know, I need to point North, then it's just quick and handy to have it on the wrist. So oh. yeah, I like those. And then not related to the lists that I'm working on, um, I'm starting to use artificial intelligence a little more. Um, and the one that I'm really liking these days, cause there's a whole bunch of these generative AI apps now, ever since chat GPT. Um, but the one I'm really liking is called perplexity. And, uh, just before we started recording here, Chris, I put in my prompt and I said, and I use this pretty regularly, but just for example purposes, I said, build me a list of astronomy objects to observe tonight. Uh, make it 10 objects. I'm located at about 50 degrees uh, north latitude. I will be using a 60 millimeter refractor and I want the list to be challenging. Uh, and I will be observing from a light polluted sky. So here's what it came up with. And you judge if it's challenging or not, uh -huh, okay. uh, given those parameters. So first object on the list, and I don't think these are in any particular 
order uh, is Saturn. So I would say not super challenging, but it did say, uh, try to observe the planet's rings and try to spot its largest moon, Titan. So Titan might be a little challenging uh, with a 60 millimeter scope, but mm. certainly doable. Uh, number two, the ring nebula. Um, not too challenging, I don't think, in a 60 millimeter. Uh, Elberio, pretty easy. Uh, mm -hmm. What do you think about M27 from my backyard? Oh, well, with a 60? Mm -hmm. Yeah, a bit challenging from a light mm -hmm. polluted backyard, yeah. Yeah, yeah, a little bit. I would agree. Uh, M13, what are your thoughts on that one? No, that should be pretty easy. Yeah, I think so too. Uh, this one is interesting. Epsilon Lyrae, so the double-double. Oh, that's easy. Yeah, a little bit on the sky conditions, but uh, certainly would need some power to split that. Yeah, that's just a power-related thing. Yeah, yeah. Uh, M31, that uh, might easy. be a little challenging. Oh, that should be, you should be able to see that in binoculars. I've seen it, yeah, I've seen it in binoculars from your backyard, actually. Oh, yeah? yeah. <laughs> so, there you I go, know that's confirmed. possible. Yeah, because I was there one night. I looked at it. I have my binoculars. I can't remember. It was like, I don't know, a couple of years ago. We were in your backyard for, that was maybe even last year. I looked at it from there with yeah, my binoculars. Yeah. I think when um, you got the, when you got the, or maybe it was when you got the 102. So it might have been two years ago. Hmm. I think I came over to look through it or something. Yeah. Cool. Uh, M11, the wild duck cluster. Easy. Yeah, agreed. Uh, NGC 457, the owl cluster. That should be pretty easy. Yeah. Yeah. And then Otherwise, the last skydiver oh, or something like skydiver. Anyway, go yeah. ahead. The last one here on the list, uh, Comet 13 P Olbers. Yeah, that's tough. Yeah. Agreed. It says currently visible in links growing at magnitude 6.7 challenging, but possible with your setup. Yeah. Yeah. I'd say that's a fair assessment. Yeah. Yeah. So kind of an interesting list, like nothing's uh, smashing on there or, or, you know, earth shattering. But what I love about the AI stuff is just how you can cater or, or customize the list to whatever you want. Like if I didn't want Saturn or whatever, you know, I could just tell it to be more specific with certain categories of objects. And, uh, it sort of does like what some of those sky tour, you know, features do on the go-to telescopes or, yeah. You know, even within Sky Safari, kind of the, you know, objects to look at tonight, um, kind of similar to that. But um, I just, again, I, I like the customization aspect of it just from, you know, changing the prompting to whatever you're interested in. Hmm. Cool. Yeah. So that's kind of my go-to set of resources. I still do use paper. Like um, one of my favorite things to do with the hidden treasures list is after I've observed and, you know, wrote down all of my observing notes is, uh, read the chapter on that particular object from Stephen James O'Meara, just to see how he described it and, and what he was able to see with his four inch refractor, uh, from very dark skies in Hawaii. Mm. So that's kind of fun too. Cool. Yeah. What is, uh, your go-to stuff for resources? Well, I, I use a combination of things. Let's say mm -hmm. probably like the main thing that, uh, that I use is just, I really like reading old books like, um, Reverend Webb had some on, you know, deep sky as well as planetary objects, um, as well as like, uh, Burnham's celestial handbook mm -hmm. and in, in Burnham's it, uh, you know, it really goes through in detail most of the objects, the night sky. But in particular, I like he has like this in, beautiful introduction. I was just like reading that that introduction and just sort of thinking about a lot of the history and uh, and that sort of thing. Uh, but Webb's book uh, in particular is Celestial Objects for Common Telescopes, um, and then it comes in these two volumes, of which uh, volume one is the solar system, and then. Uh, two is the stars, which does contain uh, some deep sky objects. It's uh, it's it's quite a good read. And then the uh, Bedford catalog as well. Like these are mm -hmm. old books. Mm -hmm. And then sometimes what I like to do, or I've I've spent lots of winter nights when it's too cold to observe, or weather's not conducive to it, um, is just going through my my atlas or atlases, and then trying to, you know. Uh, labels where some of these targets may or, or may not be like basically going through like some of the old works and 
and some of the old uh stuff like in um there's uh there's a book by um oh his name is me now but it's called the search for the nebulae and uh in in that book uh it details out like the first deep sky objects uh that were observed by uh, not just galileo but you know al sufi and and uh you know even tico and others hmm. have you ever read that no no i haven't it yeah it's uh it's pretty good and of course uh, it's ken glenn jones I, I don't know why i had to look it up it's been a long day but um that's that's the book it's it's way out of print it's part of alpha academic i do know that off by heart and uh, it goes through like those original objects then you get to messy and, but you can see this sort of paring down of the objects from the ones that were thought to be nebulous early on to to um the ones which we know to be sort of uh, more or less true deep sky objects today mm-hmm. um however like i'm just very fascinated by looking at in particular the ones that are now excluded because they didn't really know what a galaxy was or a globular cluster necessarily, or, you know, they knew the globulars and the star clusters were stars and nebulae were other stars that were unresolved or perhaps something else. And the galaxies still uh, pretty much the same thing, more or less. Um, but I, I just like looking at the old objects that sort of have, have uh, been defunct, you know, mm-hmm. um, because they were realized as soon as somebody had a, uh, two or three inch telescope or a one inch telescope, they quickly realized that, uh, you know, like F Hercules or F Hercules was, um, you know, triple star, double star, or whatever, uh, versus a, a nebulous cloud. But it's, it's fun to kind of look with the binoculars in like the seven by 35 range. And it still looks like a nebulous spot. So you can kind of sort of relive those early discoveries, which, which I kind of, I, that, that's like another project that I work on, which is kind of fun. Um, and, and by using the atlases, I like to kind of peel through and just see which targets I could focus on. And mm-hmm. what I might be able to see in particular, like large objects, just kind of scouring which which constellations are up. I'll, I'll use something like Sky Safari or or Stellarium and uh, determine where that meridian point is or where where the points on the horizon, which are going to be well placed are. And now with the uh, my setup, I can kind of pretty much observe anything so I can, you know, go right up overhead and uh, like to figure out when objects are going to be uh, in in that zone. Um, and, and another way that I'm using, uh, resources is in particular, this, this is one thing that's, that's quite a lot of fun, quite enjoyable because it, it places some of my observing out of my control, which I kind of like, um, and kind of like you referenced having, um, AI generate a bit of a list for you, uh, and then kind of going through it. That that's cool. I can see the allure of that. Uh, sort of my own version of that. I was doing that a little bit tonight before we chat. It was, uh, I really enjoy the sky and telescope magazine. I've, I've been a long time subscriber or purchaser, uh, one way or another for probably the better part of three decades. And what I like about using sky and telescope is that it creates a focus on observing targets that I would have otherwise just missed browsing around online or, trying to dream up my own stuff to observe and they they've been presenting really good asteroid and comet finder charts and lots of interesting photographs and monthly events and you know it's just it places it sort of outside your realm of control and kind of like with ai like what you were referring to shane um that is something for people to keep in mind is that in order to continue to improve and and have some sort of um, unique wonder on the night sky, it's it's nice to be presented with these surprises and things that we might not have sort of come up with on our own and to sort of have that curated by some of the best amateur astronomers in the world or just to read about how they're observing and what they're observing kind of uh, can, can shed some light on some, some interesting targets, at least for me anyway. Yeah, I love that. And you know, sometimes it's just nice to break away from a project uh, that you're observing or working on. Um, or maybe you're just sort of stuck in a bit of a rut and you're, you know, looking at the same objects and it's, you know, you just need some inspiration or something fresh. And, and, uh, even though you may have looked at some of this stuff before, it just breaks you out of sometimes a routine, which is, uh, sometimes energizing or enjoyable. 
Yeah, one of the the things is sort of serendipitous, but uh, Barnard's Atlas of Selected Regions of the Milky Way. This is one of my all time favorite texts, and I, I don't know if it's still available for purchase. A guy re released it. Dobeck was the author, and it's quite well done. And see, Barnard had catalog E. Barnard working in the uh, late eighteen hundreds, early nineteen hundreds, had catalog a set of roughly three hundred forty eight. Uh, dark spots in the sky or dark nebulae as we know them today, um, in, in which he played a pivotal role in, in discovering and and in part part of the nature of our universe, which is pretty cool. Um, and and I I like going through that. It's it's just an interesting read. The images are still beautiful today, and well uh, well eclipsed by by many amateur astronomers working with very modest equipment now. Um, what he had to go through to take those photos of which. Are, are still quite spectacular and beautiful in their sort of original form um, are, are just, it's just such a huge connection with history, but then mm-hmm. see, I'm, I'm reading sky and telescope. The August edition is, is out now. I got it a couple of weeks ago and, uh, and I'm, and I'm, you know, Brian Ventrue, who was on our show a couple of times in the past is writing this article on summer star clouds. And lo and behold, he mentions me in the article, so I'm not just saying it because of that, but it's pretty pretty cool to to be reading an article about you know um, summer star clouds, which he heavily references Barnard's at- Atlas of Select Regions of the Milky Way, but also some of maybe my my own observing and conversations with Brian, and uh, but it's his take, right? And I just love that kind of stuff mm-hmm. when somebody. That uh, that you know whether it's Brian or you or Mike or somebody else says, "Hey, remember we were looking at this," or "I know you like looking at that." Well, I took a look at this one night, or I've decided to go out and observe it. Just like with Peter, right? How Peter inspired me to go out and spend a whole night looking at globular clusters. Well, the next time we get together with Peter, like you know, the gloves are off, so to speak. I'm just kidding, but you know, the, the conversation is just that much richer, you know. And I, I have an email here to return from from Brian. He sent us an a nice note about about the the show format change um and you know not mentioning this because of that it's sort of all serendipitous because i was making up these notes even even before that um but just being able to open up a magazine and it's just like you're presented with this new and unique information in a different way than you've been thinking about it and i just i just like that it's hard the way that we tend to self curate and sort of isolate ourselves into our own niches. It kind of breaks you out of that. I just really like that. It's sort of like almost discovering something new. So, Mm -hmm. and, and here's the, here's the neat part. So I'm preparing for this and I realized, Oh shoot. Um, I really don't rely that much on the digital side of things as, as perhaps you do. Um, and I'm thinking, but I don't have Brian's article here. It's it's out at my cab in the magazine. The physical magazine is out there. <laughs> but what was really cool, this was like a, a total discovery of a digital nature, is that when I looked it up and I clicked on the link for Brian's article, it actually, because I'm uh, both a digital and a, and a physical subscriber, I think everybody is when you subscribe, mm-hmm. um, it, it actually linked me through to my copy of the digital magazine so then I was able to kind of, oh yeah. And then I kind of took another look at his article before we did this recording. So even though it's it's a physical magazine, which I mostly read in the physical form, probably 90% of my enjoyment is just using the the uh, the physical magazine. When uh, when I was working on the show, it was the digital magazine I ended up relying on. And, and certainly if I was uh, out or away somewhere, I could simply just call it the digital version or if I'm, oh, I'm you know, if I go to like the Saskatchewan Summer Star Party this year and I get out there, I'm like, oh, I remember in the April edition there was this thing. Well, I can just look it up. So so there you go. I I have a digital resource, Shane, after all. Ooh, look at that. Uh, but that's handy. That's great to know, too, that, yeah. you know, one subscription gets you both. And, uh, you know, magazines, I definitely prefer like a physical copy. Um, but occasionally it is nice to have access to to digital, especially in this case. Yeah. And I just, I always feel like I kind of have to, to support, um, you know, the magazines and there's astronomy magazine, which Alistair Lang writes for. And, and the, those are the real two that we have left here in North America. Mm-hmm. I, you know, I don't think I'm missing any. Um, and I just really enjoy them. And, and even in chatting with Alistair and, you know, and, and other folks, I'm sure they think I'm a bit 
um, out there on this, but Alistair sent me off a whole pile of magazines from Deep Sky back in the early 80s and and such. And what I did is I, I immediately grabbed them, sifted through to grab all the ones for like May and June and now July and August. And I just had them sitting in like a milk crate out of the cabin and, you know, on, on cloudy uh, nights or during the nights of perpetual twilight, I think I went through and read like 12 magazines, just like an inordinate amount, like, you know, the best uh, deep sky summer objects for like 1984, you know, and stuff like that. <laughs> it just, you know, cause it doesn't really change, right? Like the stuff is indelible, you know, and it, it doesn't matter if it was written so many years ago. And that's really cool. Like we had just had Peter on the show and then I was reading, um, an art. I can't remember who, who he was interviewing. I should, but it just skipped my mind at the moment. might've been like Clyde Turnbull. I, I think is actually who it was. Um, but I was reading this. I'm like, this is a great article. I wonder who wrote it and get to the end. Cause I just, I'm reading it like cover to cover and it was Peter Jedicky. And we literally had just interviewed him on the show like the week before. And I was just like, Oh, this is wild. Like I just, <laughs> you know, you it, it, it just kind of live in this world. Right. And, uh, it, it's just, that's one of the cool things about magazines. Cause when we sit at the computer, so often we're just going to sit down and Google stuff. And, and even now, like with all the algorithms and all this kind of stuff. And even like when we go to visit the forums, which were, you know, a, a, a you know, a regular visitor of it, you know, you kind of know what you're going to get, right. Whereas the magazine just can really knock you out of that. I wasn't really thinking about star clouds. Now I'm like, Oh, when I go down to grasslands this weekend, I'm, I'm going to have that even though in the digital format, because I didn't bring it with me. I didn't intend to. Um, now I'm like, okay, I'm going to, I'm going to really take a look at that and uh, maybe like print out a page or two from Brian's article and just kind of grab them and take them with me. Cause I, I won't have like too much time to do any serious dedicated observing, but that's the spot to observe star clouds. And then of course, Michael mm -hmm. or, or, uh, or uh, uh, Brian sends me this, this note about, you know, maybe even observing down there together. And so then, you know, Michael, Brian and I will, you know, grab those pages and kind of take a, take a peek at some of these objects. And anyway, it's just kind of cool just to kind of, uh, have those surprises, you know, um, I, I don't know how else to do that these days. You yeah, know? yeah, no, I, I like, I like that description and that makes a lot of sense to me. Um, one, one sort of, you know, maybe tie on to some of the references to old magazines is I acquired, um, sky and telescope as well as astronomy magazine, but the additions from my birth year and month, and oh, uh, yeah, I, I found that, that kind of interesting just to read through yeah. what was happening, you know, or what was topical in, in, in that time frame of, you know, 47 years ago. <laughs> yeah. And, uh, yeah, I did that too, uh, with my wife's birth year and, and, and month and have those. And occasionally we'll page through them again, just to sort of dig up some of those older or objects that were being talked about, uh, at that time. Yeah. I think like the sky and I have it downstairs, I have the sky and telescope and it's pink. I remember that. And it was like, it wasn't even an astronomy photo on the front. I think it's like people swimming in a lake or something. Like it was like <laughs> this month, no astronomy. It's like, what? <laughs> it was like kind of a bit of a letdown, but I'm, I'm being, you know, a bit facetious, but uh, I think it's because there was like a daytime meteor. So it had like a daytime meteor going through the sky over Lake Tahoe or something. And I was like, what? Yeah. It's not even an astronomy one this month. <laughs> it's yeah. So well, and I still have my, the, the first astronomy magazine I ever bought with my own, you know, pennies, uh, gosh, this would have been, was it 1986 when Halley's Comet came by? 84, I think. 84. I okay. Remember. Yeah. I bought the edition of astronomy magazine that was all about Halley's Comet and it, I still have the magazine. And if you saw it, Chris, it is like near mint because like things that I cared about when I was a kid. I like oh, it was 86. White, You're white, right. Sorry. It 86? was 86. Yeah, yeah. Okay. Um, but I, it was like white glove treatment with that stuff. And this magazine yeah, yeah. is still pristine. Uh, there's a call or there's an image of, uh, like a very thin crescent of Venus on the cover. Oh, wow. Yeah. And, uh, that's another fun one that I just pick up occasionally. And, and I'm not like a super nostalgic person, you know, with objects or, or anything like that. But for some reason, these old astronomy magazines that have like some, I guess you'd say sentimental connection for me. Uh, I really do appreciate having. I'm not nostalgic, but oh, I used to be. <laughs> All right. Yeah. Um, that, wow. You were pretty young when, uh, when you were buying that magazine, that's, I was very 
young as well. And I, I remember my father going out to look at Haley's Comet and kind of sort of thinking he might have kind of sort of saw it. But, and I think he might have even like dragged me out, but I like was just, this was way past my bedtime kind of thing. And I do not remember anything. So maybe yeah. I saw it. Who knows? Well, we, we went out. My dad took me out uh, with 10 by 50 binoculars. Oh, wow. But, like he's not an astronomer, uh, and I certainly wasn't at that time. And it was just like, well, where do we point these things? Where where is this comet? Yeah. <laughs> and really, had no idea how to find it. So we sort of, I remember panning through the sky, uh, but it was cold, and you know, I was young, so I was tired, and it was short lived. And we, to my memory, we did not see Halley's comet. Yeah, I, yeah, ours was probably probably saw a meteor or something, and thought that was it. But I, I think he did say that he took me, but I don't think, I mean, if he did, I certainly don't, don't recall anything other than being like super tired or something a couple nights when they dragged me out to see one thing or another. But, uh, mm -hmm. yeah, I think you kind of got to know what you're doing, but that's cool that you got the magazine. That's awesome. Yeah. Yeah. It's uh, again, sort of a fun thing to pick up every so often and just page through it again. And, you know, one of the things that I think resonates with a lot of people, that are into this hobby and were kids, you know, and, and would look at these magazines, like you would, at least me, I would just lust over some of like the gear photos of like, oh, that telescope looks so cool. I wished I yeah. could have that. And uh, it's kind of neat just to look at some of those old ads as well. And, you know, look at the prices of some of these, you know, uh, like telescopes and eyepieces and compare them to today's stuff. It's, uh, it's pretty interesting to see how the hobby has evolved. Yeah, I remember like when I when I was first getting the magazines, I'd be like, "Oh, like that's kind of." But I was so con like, I'm, I'm just not really like technical in a certain way, which may sound strange, but so it just kind of seemed very nebulous to me. So I was like, I can only afford binoculars, so I'm hardly even going to think about these. But in those old magazines, what really struck my attention is like when when somebody's like writing an article, and then like they would refer to these other observers. And you're like, man, these people, they must be these uh these amazing observers or whatever but they're just regular people i think but it's pretty cool to uh to have like these old stacks of magazines i do want to add one more thing this digital thing mm -hmm. this is um i think one of the most important things that people can do with astronomy software and this is sort of my last thing and uh i probably learned this even even a bit late and I know a lot of people that don't do this, and uh, this is nobody in particular, um, but we have a, there, there is somebody who lives a street over, so I'll use him as an example. I don't think he listens to the show. Um, but uh, we'd go out observing, and they would be uh, going after targets that were very close to setting um, or something to that effect, or like they were just awkwardly placed. And I would say, just run your software and see when things are going to be close to the meridian make those observations and then because that's all you can do is like however many observations you can't do that many observations in a night so mm -hmm. observe the ones that are on the meridian just use your software put your meridian line in and the meridian is the point at which things are highest above the southern horizon it's this imaginary point that runs from the south celestial pole to the north celestial pole in a big circle but as things pass through this zone that's when they're at their highest people please use this like mm -hmm. and and this is something i think that virtually everybody runs into virtually all of us have run into this and it can't be stressed enough because there's there's only so many good nights and there's only so many things you can see so unless there's something really particular really special or maybe there's that that object that you really just have to see okay i get that but if if you're working on like in this case this uh this uh, friend of ours was just a couple streets over and trying to observe like Messier four in like end of our end of September, you know, and, and yeah, it's a uh, globular cluster in Scorpius, but mm -hmm. it's not quite dark when it's at the horizon. So it's like, mm, and that night boy, isn't Capricornus nice and high, just as it gets dark and conveniently placed at the Meridian. Like this is when you want to go out after like M 30, you know, Maybe mm -hmm, like M55 mm -hmm. on that night or something like that. But anything, you know, much uh, west of the very most eastern reaches of Sagittarius. Like, just look where that meridian is and then use that as the guiding light because the next year will come around quickly enough. Like, unless there's something 
really particular, almost done a list or there's something that is really driving you forward. But I remember going out with this person on numerous occasions and they were always observing like, you know, in the Southwest, like looking through blades of grass kind of thing. And I'm like, dude, <laughs> like, just, just please don't do this. Like, you know, yeah. you know, just, just work it through. So use your, that's a good use yeah. of software, I think. Yeah, and that's I, a great tip. I like it. I use it for that all the time. You know, when yeah. things get past, I'm just like, okay, it's gone. Like what's next? What's coming up next in the Meridian? Like, it's just like, what, what's Christmas going to be next month? You know? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. No, you no great advice. Sure. doesn't feel like Christmas tonight. It's pretty warm here and we're smoky folks. So it's clearing out, but yeah. it's not been a good 24 hours. Yeah. Yeah. Hopefully it's not a sign of things to come. Yeah. Well, that's a big fire burn in Northern Alberta. So yeah. Yeah. Yeah, it's quite large, but yeah, that's gonna that's gonna be a permanent feature on the horizon, I think, for three or four weeks. Yeah, it could be sadly enough. All right, well, that's sort of it for me. Um, kind of some resources, kind of how I observe, and uh, in particular, like I'm I'm a big I like the magazines. I think people should buy them. Oh, and and the July edition had Cindy Cratch. I meant to mention that Jerry okay. Ultion had a nice article with her. She had all kinds of lunar sketches. I think like there was at least almost a dozen sketches of hers in there or something really awesome. Another person I think we're going to try to have on the show in the, the next six months. So uh, yeah, if you can get the July edition, I think if you buy them online or something, you can get the, you can go back and look at the last month or something too. So that one's well worth seeing as well. Hmm. Yeah, that's awesome. Yep. There we go. Anything to add from your side chain? That is all. Well, thanks for listening, everybody. Please subscribe and share the show with other stargazers you know. Send us your show ideas, observations, and questions to actualastronomy at gmail.com. Thank you, everyone, for listening, and we hope you enjoyed the show. If you are interested in more information, would like to contact us, or if you would like to support the podcast, check out our website, actualastronomy.com. <laughs>